So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, Your Excellencies and distinguished guests. Welcome to the High Level Roundtable, an avenue for peace, security, and sustainable development at the 2020 Orasi's Extraordinary Meeting, which is taking place today on the sidelines of the 75th United Nations General Assembly under the theme, Unite, Inspire, and Create. Sorry. In this session, we are going to discuss the potential of an African Peace Engineering Corps and why it is important for Africa. To help us navigate through this important concept, are we, going? Are we, ah, we want to thank Dr. Frank Richter for welcoming to us to Orasi's Global Vision Community and sharing yeah. with us the common yeah. yeah. and promoting African solutions for African problems. Madame Keita, bonjour. Good morning. Bonjour. Good, morning. Oui, désolé. Uh, good morning. I had the difficulties of joining. No, no worries. <laughs> no, it is early good and morning. we are very grateful. Good morning, Your Excellency. Yes, good morning, Madame Keita. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. And Thank you? you. Well, we are. We we are we are moving on in spite of all the noises, but uh, we are very focused on uh, moving the issues at hand that we consider critically important. I understand. <laughs> it looks like we lost Mr. Puyuya. We hope we will get him back. Uh, we will continue. So uh, my name is Frenya Ruiz. I'm the president of Solid Investments Group and today I will be your moderator. Um, as you can see, I am not Professor Anning, who unfortunately due to health reasons is unable to join us today. So I have to try my best to his uh, big shoes. <laughs> Before we start, uh, some practical information on this roundtable. Um, given the fact that we have about uh, an hour, a little bit more, and we would like to do a Q&A because we have some special guests from, from all over in the peace and security sector, former commander, General Ward, who would like to weigh in um, and, and give him his, some input. Um, we have Dr. Vasu Godin from Accord, we have um, Mr. Ray Hartley from the Brenthers Foundation um, and many more guests. So before we dive into the three contextualizing questions which emerged as the catalyst for this roundtable, I would like to kindly ask the interact into three to five minutes. And if you're not speaking, we mute so that we don't have the background noise. And when we are going to speak, then we... Um, since the internet is, uh, and it will allow it to be more dynamic. You are all friends, you all know each other. America. This is which, the which, platform which, where you have the voice. Um, and so it's no big speeches, but it's really what you feel about where we should go in terms of peace and security. I'm not hearing. You're not hearing? Is everybody else not hearing? I'm hearing, it's fine. We are I, I, I'm not getting on, I'm not hearing. Fra, is Frania on? Yes. Sir. Yes. Frania, I'm not getting you. I'm sorry. Try to no have. No word from you. <laughs> no. Try to have a sign out and sign back in. I am not getting any word from you, Frania. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Technology. Let me sign in. Mr. President, son is saying that you, you need to sign out and then sign in again. Oh, you okay. Me. Okay, well, I hear you clearly. Okay, okay we will sign out and sign in again. <laughs> yeah. This is the downfall of the technologies. We will wait. It's so nice to see everybody here gathered. This is really, I'm really so grateful for such a, a, a powerhouse table. Experts. Well, thank you for putting in a lot of time in uh, organizing this. 
it's been receiving uh, email back and forth from you <laughs> to others similarly. With yes, yes. yes, it's been a year since we saw each other in uh, in Accra. Yes, yes so it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, we will continue mm -hmm. and uh huh. Are you back, sir? Yes, I'm on again. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you now. Uh, oh, good. Wonderful. I am Wonderful. Here, I am only missing President Buyoya on the screen. Yes. He has not been able to sign back in yet. I'm sure they're working on it. Oh, no, I'm, it's, it's echoing. It's echoing? Yes, okay. Okay. Well, for our guests, today we are going to be speaking with His Excellency uh, Ernest Baikaroma, former president of Sierra Leone and the advocate for this African Peace Engineering Corps. Your Excellency, uh, His Excellency Pierre Buyuya, former president of Burundi and high representative for Mali and the Sahel at the African Union, who has just um, disappeared. Mm -hmm. His Excellency Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, former president of Somalia. Thank you. Dr. Amos Sawyer, former president of Liberia. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Um, and Honorable Madame Bintu Keita, Assistant Secretary General at the United Nations for Africa in the Department of Political and Peacekeeping Affairs and Peace Operations. Thank you so much for all being here today for this important conversation. And um, let's, let's move forward. I would like to kick off the roundtable with um, former President Koroma. Excellency, could you please share with us your three to five minute introductory remarks. I know that's difficult, three to five minutes, it's very short, but yes. it will help to keep us going. Well, um, um, let me thank you, Frania. Uh, I mean, I, I'm still having difficulties, uh, still some echoing sounds coming out, but let me thank you um, for chairing this occasion and for stepping into Professor Anin Sludge shoes to moderate the round table. Uh, let me also thank uh, Frank for providing this important platform uh, for us. And uh, to my colleagues, uh, former uh, heads of state and uh, uh, presidents, uh, let me thank you all and uh, uh, I want to thank you to serve as, as you are serving as panelists uh, in sharing this great vision that we have for Africa in uh, uh, developing an, a peace engineering corp. I want to specially thank uh, Madam Bintu Keita for sparing time out of a very busy schedule to be part of us. I think it's uh, an important uh, moment that we have uh, a representative of the UN at, at high level to be part of it. And uh, again, let me give very special thanks to Dr. Uh, Professor Sawyer, uh, who has taken time after a very, very uh, important and uh, major surgery that he has been through to be here. I want to thank all of you for this great commitment. Um, now, um, Africa is in the course of a tremendous growth, yet we are still challenged with issues of peace and security. At regional and continental levels, we have made great strides to resolve conflicts and address the drivers of conflict. That notwithstanding, we need an even more coordinated African-led innovative initiatives that will take us faster to our desired destination of a meaningful social and economic development. 
This must be anchored on a truly sustainable peace and security throughout the continent and also by leveraging partnerships from other parts of the world. I believe we there is a missed opportunity in limiting our existing militaries. And we have militaries, there is no African country that lacks a military. But we have limited their roles to just the traditional areas of protecting the constitution. And when um, invited here and there to serve as peacekeepers on missions, they have uh, contributed and have uh, done remarkably well. But we believe that uh, with this capacity that is now built in and it is seated here, uh, whilst in peacetime, they are still paid and most of the time we are in peace. So that is why I am of the view that we can use, utilize this, I will use it an idle talent that is being paid and it is there, uh, it is disciplined. We can use these talents of the militaries that we have uh, to be involved in our national development efforts, in uh, the construction of our social uh, programs, our social infrastructures, in building schools, in building clinics, in providing the infrastructure that is required in harder to reach areas. And because of the discipline they have, these are people that can go into areas uh, that are hard to uh, reach, even when the civilians are if given opportunities to undertake such social programs. So that is why I believe it, it is coordinated at a, a, a regional or a continental level, we will be able to utilize the military, benefit from their discipline, from their engineering capacity that they have, and uh, uh, build up social projects that will address the issues that are the basis of peace. Because let's uh, make no mistakes, most of these people that are agitating, that believe they have been left out, they have not been provided with social uh, infrastructure, the government has no presence, is because they feel left out. And uh, with the capacity that we have in the military, in our militaries, when properly coordinated and with the use of um, other experiences out, we will be able to uh, let them serve the purpose of waging peace when we already have peace and helping the various nations in building their social infrastructures. So this informs my advocacy for an uh, African Peace Engineering Corps. Thank you, Your Excellency, you. for your great thoughts. Um, it's very visionary, especially in view of the current African peace um, and security and social development realities. So uh, yes, who, would like, uh, <laughs> who would like to go? I next? am not getting any feedback. Frania? Uh, no one Hello? can hear me? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Okay. There was a problem. It's just a, a small problem. I think that this time is okay. Hello? Hello? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Your Excellency, we okay. have... Okay, we apologize. We have had some technical problems. No worries. We are all here. We understand it the... It is uh, hope it's going to work now. Do you <laughs> hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. So President Paroma just um, had the floor and gave us his introductory remarks. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Your Excellency. Madam Pierre Coordinator, I'm through with my initial comments. Your Excellency, okay. Buyuya, would you like to give your introductory um, 
remarks? Let me get from here too. But we, we, we don't hear her. We don't hear the coordinator. Yes, I don't. I also, Frania, I'm not hearing any, a word from you. How about now? No? I can hear you. Ah, Your Excellency has yes, had to uh, You can hear me. So, would you mind? Yeah, um, Rani, I don't see the others. I see you only, you and President Buyoya only. I don't see the rest of the team. Oh, I can't see. Lord, I don't know what's going on. Yes, uh, I, see I cannot see a friend here. I, I see her, but I don't uh, hear her. Oh, my goodness. Well, let's try and do our best to navigate this. Um, yeah. And being as it's live, maybe Your Excellency Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, if you could give us your introductory remarks and hopefully. I cannot hear you, Frania. Self? President Kroma, are you hearing me now? Yes, I hear you loud and clear. Yeah, and how about Professor Soya? Yes, indeed. I, I hear you. So, uh, Rania, maybe I'm, I'm, I can be the link because everybody is not hearing you. I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think, thank you, President Kroma, who presented us the idea of the uh, concept that we're discussing today. And uh, it's a great concept. I think this is a very good idea. And I think it's a workable idea that is that can be utilized properly in in African continent, as it said. There is no scarcity of uh, frame platforms and frameworks here in Africa using the regional and the African Union instruments. I think this is a concept that is very compatible with that. But as it's mentioned in in the concept paper, I think the idea of uh, having the conducive environment for them to work is very important. Our democratic initiatives, the issue of security, in particularly countries like Somalia and some of the Sahel region where the extremists and the terrorists are disturbing the normal life and the normal development. So in some places like those places, the environment is not conducive enough. So the, the, the military is the workforce that is that can work in this harsh environment. So I think this was an idea of its own time. So African Peace Engineering Corps, uh, as, as, as the concept says, it may exist in some other parts of the world and in some other continents, but here in Africa. So, so I welcome the idea and I'm very much, uh, I, I appreciate the idea itself. But the only thing that we need is that, how can we make sure that the ground is receptive for those forces. If they continue to fight, then the other aspect will, will be limbo, will go into a limbo and it will be very difficult. So we have to be very selective, I think, where the, mo the maximum utilization is possible for, the, for, this con for this idea of engineering corps to work. But all of Africa, I think, uh, maybe according to time, timely, they can work some places in, in a very, very stable and po real post-conflict places like Sierra Leone and maybe uh, Liberia and other places and those who never want to. But again, those who does not have a problem of conflict, the fragility issue, fragility in terms of governance, in terms of democratic basis, institutions, that can work, how we can make our people believe what what they are capable of. This is a very important. So parallel to the military, I think uh, the civil society are also the component that is very appropriate for introducing the concept to the local people and civil society who are the local civil society, the, not the, the, the national civil society or even the, the regional or continental civil society. It is the local civil society at the village, at the district, at the county. 
that's more helpful. So the, the, the attaching together those local civil societies and those military units, I think they are very, very productive and, and they can be very productive in those areas where there is a relative stability. Yes, fragility is always there, but the most important basic thing is the, I think the idea is that, and I think the idea that came its own time, and I congratulate those who are initiated the idea, including and leading President Cromo and the colleagues, I really seeing it a very, very good future for Africa. Uh, the other aspect is of the African problem of uh, collective bargaining and mutual dialogue and all this for the multilateralism is completely another issue. The, multi, the mutual, the mutual dialogue is very important. The multilaterals themselves, they need some sort of adjustment. They should not, they should give space to the local people, local leaders, and local initiatives, and not uh, the global. Of course, these are global agendas, human rights, freedom of expression, democratic, women rights, all these, but at least there must be components that goes with them, or those co elements should be localized, should be localized and should be addressed according to the capacity and the level of possibility that's possible. But if it becomes a stick to banish, that you are not doing right in the human rights, you are not doing enough freedom of expression, and then the focus uh, diverges to addressing those making the priority, the only priority to satisfy the masters, this would be a bit difficult. And this is the challenging issues that we had, uh, I'm sure, in many parts of Africa. Here, in my experience in Somalia, is that sometimes it diverts your attention away by emphasizing this, yes. But, you know, it's a natural tendency that wherever there is a weak a law enforcement agencies, you, you cannot claim that you can have a, a perfect human rights uh, uh, level. Always, we need to be a bit moderate. We always, human rights are basic. I believe a human rights uh, development is subject to human rights. Wherever there is abuse of people, wherever there is uh, people who are denied. Well, we lost him. We have lost you. <laughs> yeah, we have lost him. Okay. No, he is. I lost. Okay. I lost everybody. I'm not seeing no one, but I think oh, people oh, can yes. hear me. Uh, okay. Just concluding. That's how I see it. And uh, thank you very much. Time is very limited. We're consuming a lot of time with this difficult technology. So that's my my take. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Your Excellency uh, Prebuyuya, would you like to? Uh, Mr. President, if you allow me, I, I would like also to say something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. First, uh, le let me say that uh, it's a, an honor and a privilege for me uh, to be invited and to participate to this high level panel. And uh, I am grateful to, uh, to you. Your Excellency President uh, Koroma, who uh, has uh, motivated me to, to participate. Uh, then uh, the idea of uh, this uh, Peace Engineering Corp, Corps, let me first try to put it in the framework of uh, uh, the African Union Mechanism for Peace and Security. And before that, let, uh, let me uh, greet all the Excellencies, uh, President uh, Amos Sawyer, uh, my sister uh, Bintu Keita, uh, you, Your Excellency, uh, President Sheikh Ahmed, uh, for uh, since the creation of uh, of uh, uh, the Pan African Organization, OAU, and then later African Union, uh, the top priority uh, of those organizations has been uh, maintaining uh, peace and security on the continent. 
and uh, building on the experience of uh, conflict resolution in the, the 19s, the African Union has put in place policies and mechanisms allowing it to take more and more responsibility in the area of uh, peace and security on the continent. And one of uh, the flagship document is the protocol creating the Peace and the Security Council adopted in July 2002. Uh, the so-called African Union Architect for Peace and Security, APSA, uh, was created in this document. And uh, the APSA uh, stressed the role of African institution in the matter of conflict resolution, uh, starting from the prevention, going through the management of the conflict and uh, to the peace building in the context of uh, post-conflict uh, uh, <clears throat> post-conflict reconstruction. And uh, the other upside dimension is that it values the multilateralism. It indicates very clearly how the African Union work with the international community, especially with the United Nations. Uh, and if we look at what is happening on the ground, on the continent, uh, be it in Somalia, uh, Sahel, the Great Rex region, the two institutions, the UN and the African Union, are working hand in hand in peace prevention, peacekeeping, and peace building. <laughs> For example, to talk about what very close to me, here in, in Mali and in, in Sahel, we are working very closely with uh, uh, the UN Special Representative in the mediation uh, all the time when we are facing a crisis, uh, special for example, the, the, the recent one in Mali, we have been working together to try uh, to mediate between the different uh, actors. Uh, the same can be said about the cooperation between EU and the European Union. And uh, these last years, the working together in this area of peace and security has been systematic and formalized on the highest uh, level. We have now regular consultation between the UN Security Council and the AU Peace and Security, between the UN Secretary General and the Chair of the, the, the AU Commission. The same consultation are taking place on the operational level and the lower level, the low echelon in charge of planning and implementation. Then in the summary, we could say that uh, multilateralism for us, for African Union, is not a choice. It's a, a, a strategic uh, must. And uh, <clears throat> In my capacity of uh, High Representative for Mali and Sahel, I have been involved in many debates on how to modernize uh, APSA, African uh, Peace and Security Architecture, uh, because uh, APSA is now 20 years old and it needs to be updated especially two pillars, the Peace Fund and uh, the Standby Force. 
Then, uh, in my opinion, the idea of peace engineering corps could be one way to modernize APSA in focusing on post-conflict reconstruction. It could complement what we, we have started to establish now, uh, what it's called now, the, the, the youth corps, uh, which is a reality now. And the benefits of this kind of innovation are obvious as it has been outlined in concept note. We should not, however, forget to foresee a number of challenges when it comes to implement the project. And one of the biggest challenge has to do with financing. When I look at uh, how our armies are equipped, especially in the technical areas, it's clear uh, to me that uh, this uh, project could be difficult to implement. Lack of adequate equipment has been the limitation of the African Union standby force, especially when it comes to heavy equipment like armored vehicle, like fire support and air support. For me, the way forward to make the Peace Engineering Corps a, a reality would be uh, first to, to finalize the concept note and especially to indicate the feasibility uh, of the project when it comes to financing. A second, to lobby African Union for an endorsement in this framework of how to modernize uh, APSA. And maybe the second, uh, the, the following uh, stage would be to create for me at the level of the regional economic uh, uh, communities, uh, an experimental unit, a kind of uh, center when you can uh, train the people, you can also uh, acquire some equipment, and the following stage would be then maybe an experimental deployment in the context of uh, post-conflict uh, situation in a given countries. And this unit then can be help to rehabilitate the schools, the clinics, uh, the, the, the infrastructure, uh, and especially in uh, the, the, the remote areas. I think uh, maybe then the most important stage is to make sure it, to, to, to have an endorsement at the level of uh, African Union. And I think it could be possible because Africa needs so kind of uh, innovation if it wanted to remain credible and, and relevant and, and uh, in its seek of taking more and more responsibility in peace uh, building on the continent. Your Excellency, those uh, are some ideas I would like to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was very, very enlightening. Can we hear from you? Can you hear me? Can anyone hear me? So, Madam. Yeah. Uh, may, may I speak? Mahmoud can hear me. Dr. Sawyer, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Hear you. Yes. Everyone can hear me except for you. Could someone let him know that everyone else can hear him except for me as well as the audience? 
Mm. Your Excellency, we can hear uh, Franja and everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, we hear you. We hear you. We hear you. Madam. No. Madam, we hear you. Yeah. So, you, yeah, Franja, it's, it's yes. you only. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Let me uh, first uh, thank uh, the organizers of uh, this uh, extraordinary meeting, the larger meeting, uh, Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter and the people of uh, Horizons. And thank you to uh, Fania for the efforts you have made in organizing all of this. Uh, our special thanks go to President Kroma uh, for having put this idea on the table and um, for having the tenacity to see it through to uh, a stage where we are now discussing, we are exploring and coming up with ideas as to how we, how we move forward uh, with, with, with it. We want to thank uh, all of the uh, distinguished participants, our dear colleagues, your excellencies, uh, for taking time to uh, uh, discuss, to appear on this panel and to discuss this, uh, this idea. This is an excellent idea. It has uh, floated uh, time and again, and I think it is important in view of the continuing and in many cases increasing challenges of human security in Africa. Um, we, we are still, we are making considerable progress in Africa, but at the same time, uh, human security remains at stake. From poverty and chronic sustained marginalization of certain sectors of our populations to climate change challenges and to violent extremism. We still have to deal with these, uh, the, these problems. And in dealing with them, we are challenged by two sets of many issues, many issues, but two sets of issues having to do with state capacity and having to do with governance failures or governance challenges, uh, in my mind, come to the forefront. And in a way, uh, the questions of state capacity uh, is assisted through an initiative of this type, the capacity to deliver services across groups to reduce marginalization and therefore to address many of the other related uh, related issues. Also, the question here of the challenge regarding how we utilize human resources in Africa also comes to the forefront. And here is, in a way, our paradox where we have population, particularly youthful population, and we are yet under capacity, under capacitated, where we are not able to deploy effective human resource to resolve or to address some of our problems. So the idea of the Africa Peace Engineering Corps uh, becomes a very important and relevant uh, one that we need to look at. And I'm happy the president 
President Kroma has said, while it is, well, we are talking about an engineering core, uh, he puts it in a broader context of addressing a, a range of development issues. It could be a core that might, uh, uh, have some sectors that, uh, segments that could address some literacy issues or some health issues or so. Because the challenges are, are enormous and, uh, we have to address them all since put together, they contribute to our state of underdevelopment and uh, they undermine human security. I think there are nonetheless uh, some challenges uh, which we would help to to look at. Um, the first, I think, is how we get this idea off the table. And I think President Buyoya has given us some ideas as to how we can get integrated within the African Union security, peace and security architecture. And so that's from the continental level, how we can begin to work. But we have to also start to work this idea from the national level uh, so that it is acceptable uh, within the context of uh, our various countries uh, to find areas where, as has been suggested, a question of peace building, um, sorry, uh, peacekeeping is transitioning to peace, peace building and where there are issues of rehabilitation that are at uh, on the table right now, that they can be, uh, that this idea can become, uh, can get introduced. I'm also thinking of the need to, to begin to think about how this idea will transform or in a way affect the civil military relationships within countries. And what kinds of adjustments would uh, have to be made? How do we uh, get civil society, the military, and the government, and the actors uh, together to uh, reach a consensus? Because this this is introduction of uh, some new roles for already existing institutions, as President Kruman said. Every country has a, a military of one kind and another. This would require some kind of building of new consensuses within within countries, broad-based policy agreements among disparate uh, groups, reduction of suspicion with respect to the dynamics of internal politics. Um, all of these issues would would have to uh, would have to be looked at in a case by case ish a case by case basis. I also think that, uh, as has been mentioned, the regional dimension of this sub regional dimension might be important. Some sub regions might be ready some uh, to 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 look into some of these issues. Now, um, I think in the the Mano River issue uh, uh, area, uh, the ECOWAS area, I, I think we can find already um, certain kinds of developments that would support, that would benefit from uh, this uh, expanded role of, uh, of, our, of our military. I think uh, we are talking about how we can link this exercise with our training institutions, our uh, institutions of technical, vocational education, our institutions of higher learning, bringing the military again within the scope of, um, of, of interacting with uh, our educational institutions uh, again, one of the transformations that are necessary for military-civilian relationships. So there's a lot that can be done, and we will all benefit, uh, various countries, from this uh, this idea. But uh, we need to 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 have some sub-regional champions, I think, 
for for this uh, for, for for this idea, so that when we are talking about it at the level of the African Union, we are also talking simultaneously at the level of national and regional, uh, uh, the regional and national levels, and uh, softening the ground, if you will, for moving on with uh, with an idea of, uh, of, of of this type. Um, there are countries that already have uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, practices regarding the military that might well be ready to champion some of some of this. There are some countries that are doing well with respect to uh, the military and issues of health. Uh, many African countries now, some West African countries have military hospitals. How do we integrate the military and the health issues that the military are de dealing with, especially with respect to referral hospitals to move from the, uh, the military hospital to the clinics, to public health issues, all within that country and across borders through the regional kinds of uh, uh, interactions. So there are some 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 nuggets already present that we can begin to build on at multiple levels, building at the country level, building at the sub regional level, and also building at the level of our African Union. And so let me just uh, congratulate President Kroma again for coming through these ideas. Now is the, so the ball is in our court, and we can all work and see how we can get this going. Of course, the idea of financing, how we're going to get it all financed, uh, this is where our own resources as well as, you know, multilateral might be of some, some, some help in all of this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Thank you so much for your insights. Uh, Madame Bintu Keita, the floor is yours, finally. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Fania, for first of all the invitation, but particularly to His Excellency Ernest Bai Koroma, uh, because I know that uh, if I'm on this panel, it's because uh, he has insisted for me to be on, on it. So I'm very, I'm very honored and uh, privileged uh, to be uh, on this panel with uh, so uh, distinguished uh, former head of state. Uh, and also being the only woman actually on the panel with Tanya, uh, which is also an interesting uh, take. Um, anyway, and not being former president. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, yes, really, thank you for 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 this. And I think this conversation is really timely. Uh, and uh, when I say timely, I, I looked very attentively to the concept note. And uh, as I was going through the concept note, uh, came to mind of the time where we were fighting Ebola in West Africa. And uh, particularly, uh, I served uh, in all the countries, actually, uh, and uh, particularly in Sierra Leone. And there was a really very good partnership between the uh, civilian and the military and the way uh, they engage in the response. And it was besides the uh, military from Sierra Leone, we also had uh, the military from other countries that have joined uh, into the, the fight. So I think there is really something there in terms of how we respond uh, to uh, the use of the workforce, which is available, readily available in countries, and how through partnership this can be enhanced in order to support the sustainable development goals. And the reason why we are uh, interacting on this platform is because of COVID-19. So you see the parallels that I want to draw between how the military were extremely helpful in the fight against Ebola, and we still have Ebola in the Eastern DRC right now. Wow. And uh, during the time of COVID-19, if we were to mobilize the resources uh, through the military in terms of all the constructions that are necessary to build isolation facilities and uh, uh, create uh, the different uh, elements uh, where people will feel safe to go, uh, it is important. Now, some of the challenges I see is how the military are perceived 
in countries. Uh, I can come to it in, in the context of the UN peacekeeping. Uh, and then I say in the context of the multilateralism uh, taking in, into account that uh, we are now celebrating the 75th anniversary of, uh, of the, the United Nations. And I want to thank all of you uh, for contributing to uh, the celebration of this anniversary. And at the same time, uh, we have to look at uh, ways where Africa more and more from, let's say, if we were to do a uh, countdown, uh, 15 years ago, most of the African uh, uh, peacekeeping operation, the soldiers who would be there, the peacekeepers, would be from other continents. Nowadays, uh, if we do the countdown, the, among the top five, we have Rwanda and we have Ethiopia uh, in, in the top five on the continent because the largest peacekeeping operation are on the continent. So if we think about also the commitment that more than 150 member states have done to action for peacekeeping and thinking of it as a way where the military are going out, but they are coming back to the countries. So the, all the efforts that are put into training, equipment, all of this is coming back to the country. So if there is a know-how and a knowledge which is also acquired in country first, then in the context of their uh, operation and contribution to the UN peacekeeping, back again to the country. So for me, the way to move this forward, besides all which has been already said with regard to the African Union, APSA, and looking at it as one component which can be built on in order to further of uh, the ideas that uh, you have put forward, uh, uh, Your Excellency uh, Koroma, is uh, to look at ways where definitely uh, getting the traction from within, thinking through in the uh, national development uh, uh, setting, because we are talking about the sustainable development goal. So it means that the Ministry of Planning, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Budget, have to come all together and yeah. think through with the Ministry of Defense what this would mean in order to change uh, the way uh, the forces are seen as contributing to the development of the country. And I have a dream. The dream is the following. You, I think you have touched on uh, the use and uh, also the, uh, the usefulness of the, of the continent. Um, when I was recently in a country, young people were talking with me saying, you know, we are looking at uh, uh, contributing in our country, national level, but we are also looking at it 